So um, the next one is we're going to be talking about financing growth. We're going to be talking about different uh, ways startups can get capital. Um, and I'm very, very happy that today we have a very experienced and very knowledgeable panel. Um, so first, I would ask everyone, starting with Steven, to briefly introduce themselves. Sure. Thanks, Dimitri. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Steven Fang. Uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur, um, and I've been involved in uh, investing and starting up uh, biotech as well as uh, uh, med tech companies uh, over the last um, 20 odd years. Um, currently, uh, you know, I, I've taken companies from all the way from startup to growth stage, raising monies from private uh, investors, angels, VCs, uh, all the way to IPO, uh, and I've since done uh, about three IPOs, um, some more successful than others. Uh, I'm also a partner at ClearBridge, which is a, a biotech uh, incubator. Uh, and more recently, uh, we've been involved with uh, creating a funding or capital raising platform uh, in partnership with uh, Singapore Stock Exchange. Excellent. Okay. Uh, I'm Muhammad Nasi Ismail. I'm from the Singapore Exchange. Uh, I'm heading the uh, small and medium enterprises listing development division uh, in the exchange. Uh, I've been with the exchange for 10 years in various roles, primarily on the regulatory side of things. Uh, so we've been working uh, at developing a platform with uh, uh, my friend here, Stephen, to serve the startup community here better. Um, my name is Dimitri Elmov. I'm the founder of Frontier Ventures. We're a VC fund. Uh, my background is uh, entrepreneurial and uh, investor background. I co-founded a company called IVI, which is an online video company similar to Netflix, uh, which now has about 30 million users uh, operating in Russia. Uh, and uh, right now I'm focused on investing <coughs> early in early stage technology companies starting from Series A. Uh, we recently opened an office in Singapore, so hopefully I'll, I'll be able to help some of the companies in the room finance our growth. Chip. Thank you. I'm Chip Korn. I'm a partner with Denton's. Uh, based in New York. Denton's is a uh, global law firm, actually the, the largest uh, law firm in the world by lawyer headcount, uh, with uh, about 3,000 lawyers in Asia, uh, including an office here in Singapore. Uh, I co-head uh, our startup practice in the US and spend a lot of my time working with uh, young to growth stage uh, technology companies, VCs, and other investors. Uh, around the states, both in the U.S. and cross borders. Uh, good morning. My name is Maurizio. Um, I'm the co-founder of Age Farm Ventures, which is a kind of platform for innovation, just in the outskirts of Venice in Italy. Uh, our <coughs> we have we're based on three business legs. One is equity business, so we do investment. And our one is. Uh, based on revenues and we work into the digital transformation to help corporates and enterprise to innovate. And then we have the third one, which is education. So we have a unit at Vision that is focused into the education for the next um, entrepreneurship generation. Uh, my background is uh, entrepreneurial, so I've always been an entrepreneur in my life. Uh, previously doing this business, which is uh, 10 years already. I've been involved with to the fashion uh, business and to the action sport industry. Excellent. So as you can see, we have a lot of experience in this panel, both across different geographies, but also across different stages of financing. So the first question I'd like to kick off the panel with uh, is I would like the panel to assess the sort of the current state of Southeast Asia uh, financing uh, ecosystem, starting with the angel uh, up until, I suppose up until going public or being acquired. Uh, and um, I'd like Stephen to maybe kick off uh, this discussion and give his perspective. Yeah, I think the funding opportunities uh, within Southeast Asia is still very fragmented. Um, but definitely gaining traction and some level of maturity. Uh, we see angel networks and angel associations uh, being formed, uh, not just, uh, for Singapore, we have our own angel um, uh, network, but uh, in Malaysia and in Indonesia and Philippines, those are also coming to 
uh, become uh, an alternative mainstream way of funding a startup. Uh, we see a lot of family offices um, coming on stream, uh, particularly out of uh, Indonesia, and they've been active looking at transactions or investment opportunities, not just uh, within Indonesia, but also uh, from around the, the, the region. Um, VC seems to be a, a kind of a, uh, in flux. Uh, I mean, uh, Clearbridge itself is kind of a VC ourselves, but we call ourselves incubated because we actually get involved in running some of these companies. Uh, so the, the model for VCs is also changing, and I think a lot of that is driven by market, a lot of that is driven by the type of companies that's coming on stream, um, and of course institutions. I think uh, uh, there's a fair bit of activities with institutional investors, uh, either corporate ventures or um, you know, other type of bigger funds. Uh, but for them, uh, they are looking at more bigger deals, uh, therefore you tend to look at uh, more uh, large, larger scale companies uh, uh, those that are either previously state-owned or uh, have been around like family-owned businesses that is being transitioned to uh, become more of a corporate uh, rather than family-held. Um, lots of opportunities, but at the same time, I think uh, also some level of uh, uncertainty in terms of exactly how Southeast Asia is going to uh, mold and shape out uh, and, and the type of uh, funding space that one wants uh, to, be, uh, to be in. For companies, what it means also is that uh, you should uh, look at uh, uh, beyond Southeast Asia. There are opportunities to raise funds, but obviously for many um, uh, companies, but particularly uh, technology-based company, where you are reliant on bigger markets uh, outside and beyond Southeast Asia, you should be thinking about raising uh, smart money, where some of these monies can actually take you to some of these other uh, bigger markets like the US and, and Europe. Interesting. So Someone on the panel, would you venture a comparison between Southeast Asia and maybe some of the other markets, US, Europe, uh, other parts of Asia, uh, or, or just generally, like, uh, what are your observations on, on how this region vers looks versus the rest of the world? Uh, uh, I'll start, you start. Okay. Uh, well, as compared to the US, I mean, o over the, say, past ten, 10 years or so, I think we've seen um, institutional investors move much earlier than, than they had in the past. Um, uh, you know, the, the first round of funding for a company w was usually the friends and family round that was pieced together uh, and the company was bootstrapped pretty far along. And now, um, you know, we've seen uh, not just angels become institutionalized, but um, but funds moving down into that very early stage space in a meaningful way, uh, as well as uh, maturity of, of accelerators and incubators um, as a way to add value at that early stage. But I, I think, you know, from the, on the VC side, those funds that have moved um, earlier, um, you know, it, it's really important, you know, as you were just saying, that that money be a value add. Um, because, you know, to get the company um, you know, over proof of concept and ready for launch and ready to scale. Uh, the money that needs to be coming in needs to be smart money. So the, those funds, you know, oftentimes we see are former operators that uh, are putting the money in and um, really then uh, serving on the board in an advisory capacity in a really meaningful way. Can I just uh, add on to what Kwan has just said? Uh, I think one of the other um, funding or investment trend uh, is this whole space of equity uh, crowdfunding or, or rewards crowdfunding. Um, on the onset, I mean, we, we looked at it and, and one of the reasons why we partner up to create this uh, capital raising platform, uh, it's not so much to, to follow the, the herd or follow the trend of uh, creating these sort of uh, um, uh, funding platforms, but indeed, as you have said, I think more and more so, uh, given the rapid development of some of these technology-based investment, you have to follow very quickly. Um, it's quite different from uh, biotech, for example, where the investment horizon is 10 to 15 years. For some of these, uh, you know, uh, um, internet uh, portal companies and some of these uh, device companies, wearable devices, um, they are looking at the three-year window. So if you're not there, from the early stage, uh, you tend to miss out because once they grow, uh, they tend to uh, work with the same group of investors uh, 
who they think are smart monies and they can take them through. So, you know, uh, CapBridge, which is the platform that uh, we have in partnership with uh, SGX, uh, actually addresses that space. Um, and of course, the bigger question is, um, is Asia gonna, or Southeast Asia and Asia at large gonna follow what the US, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, land, the, the landscape in the US is developing? And I think, in my opinion, it will. Uh, this whole space is going to evolve so fast, and we're talking about literally months, not years, mm -hmm. for it to really uh, uh, stabilize, for it to mature, and we will be looking at doing deals 24-7. Interesting. If I can add something, I, I also agree that like ecosystems, they are keep changing very fast. And I see some similarities like in between Europe and Asia, due to the different cultures. And if we consider the cost of entrepreneurship is gonna be much, much lower over the next year, we'll see millions of new entrepreneurs joining. And the impact is gonna change over the future, the way how the investment will be made, how the VCs will work, how the corporates will invest. So I believe by the next five years, we'll see really a lot of changes like local small ecosystem that now still keep growing in somehow intersecting into a major one. Okay, well thank you. Um, so the next question is kind of a really practical one. So I'm sure there are a lot of entrepreneurs in the room and a lot of entrepreneurs who are thinking about raising financing or about to raise financing. And we've touched on some aspects of it, but maybe I'll post to the panel how does an entrepreneur in Southeast Asia or in Singapore or some of the other countries of Southeast Asia, uh, how do they make these choices? How do they decide who to go to for capital? And let's focus for now on sort of the seed and the uh, VC stages of the financing. How do you make that decision? Who wants well, to? Well, I'll, I'll jump in. I mean, the, the uh, there's a bunch of factors. You know, that we were just talking about the value add of the investor. So there, there's also uh, the dilutive impact to the founders and the team. They, you know, you've got to balance that clearly uh, against the amount of capital you're going to raise, uh, and, and that's a consideration that also often comes into play when companies are looking at accelerator programs. Um, is you know, in terms of equity, what's the cost going to be for me, and how do I weigh that value. Um, and then, you know, there, there are many options, but other is bootstrapping and maxing out your credit cards uh, until you, you get to the point where you're um, hopefully uh, suffering less elution. Uh, but, but often uh, I find, you know, um, as the ecosystem matures, it becomes easier to get the advisors around you that will help you grow, but perhaps at an earlier stage, um, you need to you know, seek out the smart money in terms of uh, you know, super angels or accelerators or, or other programs to, to build on that ecosystem. I, I think um, as far as uh, uh, angel round, I, I mean, you look at Asia today, there's a lot of money flowing around, a lot. Um, in fact, there are more money looking for uh, projects to invest in. There's just not enough good uh, companies to invest in. And I know it sounds strange, but that's what we, within the industry, we keep hearing. Uh, I think when it comes to um, angel round, uh, raising angel round investment, seed, pre-seeds and, and seed round, um, and I've been on both sides of the fence, um, one thing to keep in mind uh, is to find angel investors that uh, shares your passion. These guys are not investing for strict return. I mean, there's expectation of return, but really they're investing in you and they're investing in your idea because they like your idea, you know, particularly in, uh, uh, in biotech, you know, when you're talking about, oh, there's this new life-changing life technology. So that, that's how I, I saw, um, or, or, you know, put together an investment uh, early investment round for Court Life, one of the company which I, I founded. Um, and then when you migrate and you grow towards uh, uh, venture cap, I think at least within Asia, um, you just need to basically pick the, the smart ones. Um, they, when you get traction and you have some successes uh, and, and people know that you're on your way to something, right? 
uh, they, they, they will come to you, you know, because they're looking for good deals to, to do, right? Then that's where you can start to be a little bit selective. And within Asia, um, uh, uh, you know, there, there's a fair bit of uh, VC activities and, and capital that's available. If you can have a, a very clear roadmap um, towards, uh, say, a, a liquidity event or an exit. Uh, and then we, we try to capture part of that, you know, in, in the uh, platform that uh, we, we, are, we have built. Uh, it, it actually try and promote uh, those kind of uh, uh, communication between buyers and sellers. Uh, it also try to create the, the, the smartness in money. I mean, we always talk about smart money, but we haven't really thought about what exactly it does. <laughs> right? So we try and capture that uh, with you know entrepreneurs, uh, people who have built companies, as well as institutions, uh, you know, like SGX, who actually take company all the way to public. Um, and there's a great deal to be said about, you know, finding the right type of investors for the right stage of growth uh, and eventually being successful in ensuring you have uh, multiple rounds of funding and support. Interesting. So uh, one recurring theme we hear from a lot of the panelists is try to find the smart money, hopefully with, uh, from people who've done the entrepreneurial uh, route before themselves and uh, can help you in uh, growing your venture. Maritza, do you want to touch on the role of the accelerators uh, in the early stage ecosystem, both based on your experience in Europe and to the extent that you're seeing something <coughs> in this region, uh, maybe you can uh, give your overview. Okay. I see the accelerator or incubator in somehow going to change over the next uh, future uh, pretty, pretty much. Uh, we know Accelerator is part of the, let's say, supply chain because they create deal flow for investors. It's fine, especially where there is an ecosystem like uh, in Silicon Valley or in Israel where there are a lot of investors ready to invest. But if we consider the collision of the tech economies with the traditional economies, uh, accelerators will become very attractive also for corporates and enterprise in order to in somehow outsource the innovation of new talents because one of the problem is the innovation with these technologies cannot be handled inside a corporation cannot be this is generational shift and uh, I see uh, we start a program as an age farm together with Techstars in the United States uh, last year to do some programs with uh, enterprises. So Techstars started some uh, corporate acceleration program with uh, at Disney, with Berkeley's, with Nike, and uh, we just running one now with the Techno Gym. And I have to say, which is very very interesting, because we have a number of new startup. Uh, growing, that not all of them can be funded, that not all of them can close the cycle of the value, raising the money, grow, and then return the value because of an acquisition. And at the same time, a, a number of industries will start to react from this impact, from this collision by the new, the new the new patterns, the new models coming with the startup. And uh, they have no ways to do their corporate ventures or all those activities are not really performing very well. So it looks like interesting because it's part of the evolution of the ecosystem that some, not all accelerator, but some accelerator or some incubators very close with, the, with some industries or vertical can provide an answer or try to get different classes and run programs, some addressed to the, uh, let's say, uh, industries, and some other for the investors. So we are working now in tuning this one, but it looks like very interesting, very promising for the future. Interesting, so you uh, sort of went uh, the direction of one of the questions I was about to ask is, how does the sort of traditional corporate enterprise world fit into this uh, innovation growth, and what role can they play uh, so that's interesting to hear about your experience in Europe, but maybe I can open this question to other panelists as well. Uh, what do you see uh, maybe in this region, uh, most importantly, but also in some of the other regions you're observing, where does the corporate uh, world fit in? Is it just financing? Is it sort of more strategic sales opportunities? 
uh, what, what are you actually observing? You know, some of the Unilever and Coke and some of the other activities that you may be seeing in this region. So I, I think um, uh, wearing my other hat uh, as the chairman of FACE, which is a nonprofit uh, organization that supports the entrepreneurial movement for uh, startups and, and, and young companies. We, we've seen a significant increase in activities and interest from uh, large corporations uh, to basically uh, access uh, not just local, mar uh, local market knowledge or through some of these startups, but they are beginning to recognize that there are some interesting uh, innovations from uh, around the region. Uh, and, and in Singapore, we've been uh, very uh, proactive in terms of promoting that kind of uh, collaboration. So there are actually government funds that can come in and support uh, if you have a startup with a uh, MNC uh, to, to jointly come together and build something or, or undertake a project. And in essence, that, that's actually one of the other more interesting thing about Singapore, and I, I don't mean to be selling Singapore so hard, but I want to, uh, is that we, we, I think among all the Southeast Asian countries, uh, we have the highest availability of uh, government grants. Right? You can have a grant for everything from buying a computer all the way to starting up a foreign office. So uh, this is just one example you know, where uh, it promotes and encourages uh, startup companies working with mature companies, particularly if there's new technology that can come out of this. Um, some specific examples, for exa uh, like in ACE, we work with Google and Microsoft as well as um, Cisco. And they are always on the lookout. They run their own events uh, where they are trying to filter and, and understand some of these opportunities from startups. Some of the technologies that they have that could potentially that they could invest uh, or they could support with the view that uh, it could become one of their extended product lines, for example. So we we're beginning to see an increase in those kind of activities. And I think for startup companies, uh, you, you should start looking at, at those kind of funding, um, uh, non-dilutive um, opportunities from the government. Interesting. If I can just ask a question, as an investor, a financial investor, are you helping your portfolio companies to access that non-dilutive finance. Obviously, it's to your benefit, Ren, as a you know, these are kind of almost leveraging those dollars for your financial return. Yeah, that's a good question. So I, I'm a GP, a general partner at, the, at, at uh, ClearBridge as an mm -hmm. incubator. Uh, and we actually do access a lot of these co-financing and grants. Uh, and for one of our incubators, we actually raise as much as $8 million for early wow. on. Not bad, I mean, yeah. considering <laughs> where we are. And I think the opportunity is definitely there, and, and uh, I work very closely with the government. I, can, I tend to bridge the government and uh, the startup community as well. And the government is always looking for new ways and how they can stay relevant uh, you know, uh, to, to support this uh, initiative. Singapore is a small place. You know? uh, we're a red dot, and, uh, and uh, one of the things that we don't have enough of uh, is um, startups. And uh, I think the government has been very, very um, um, keen and, and, and proactive in terms of providing those kind of funding support as well as opening doors. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, Dimitri, back to your original question on, on corporate uh, investing, um, uh, I see really a whole range as markets mature. Um, going back to what Mauricio said, we, we've actually seen accelerators um, that uh, are providing services really for no fee, no equity because they're sponsored by corporates who are getting a first look at uh, technology and innovation that um, ultimately they might want to acquire. Uh, and then, um, you know, as to corporate venture funds, I know a number of whom are here, you know, they really run the gamut um, and can change over time and what their investment objectives are from a purely financial one to more of a strategic objective. Can't hear you. You have to turn on his mic. Can someone please turn up the screen mic? You might have to still. Yeah, okay, great. Perfect. So uh, to recap, uh, we've spent some time talking about the traditional sorts of financing, such as angels, uh, seed funds, VC funds, corporations. Uh, but one um, subject that I wanted to spend more time talking about is the new generation of crowdfunding uh, and similar platforms that are just coming onto the market 
in the US and now increasingly in Asia. And I'm glad that today we actually have um, Nasser and Steven uh, here on the panel with us. And in fact, I know that they're working on a few interesting ideas. So maybe you can tell us a little bit more about some of the programs that you're currently working on in this direction. Um, so let me start by first providing some background as to the thinking behind the Singapore Exchange getting involved in uh, uh, this capital raising platform with uh, Stephen and Kia Bridge Accelerator. I think uh, since about seven or eight years ago, uh, we looked at the landscape and decided that uh, in order to better serve the uh, SME community, uh, we should we look at how we uh, admit companies onto the exchange and allow them uh, better access to the capital markets. And that led to the reinvention of our second board uh, into the Catalyst board today, which we modeled uh, after a sponsored supervised regime, whose design uh, basically allows uh, companies at an earlier stage of their development to be able to get listed and access the capital markets so that they can have uh, more uh, efficient capital raising exercise at an uh, even earlier stage. Traditionally, uh, in order to be admitted into the public markets, the admission standards require you to be of a certain size and a certain profitability. So these were done away with and we had really uh, simple admission criteria which uh, required you to demonstrate healthy financials and a sustainable business model in order to be able to access the capital markets in order to fuel your growth. So this was the design for high growth companies uh, on the Catalyst board and it has worked fantastically well for the exchange. Uh, and when we reviewed the situation a couple of years ago, what we realized is that, uh, as alluded to by uh, Stephen and the other panelists, that the need for capital from entrepreneurs are coming at an even earlier stage of their lives and they need it more urgently and they're growing at a rap far rapid rate. Uh, so then the question for the exchange is then how can we uh, create a facility for entrepreneurs to access capital markets better and gain the capital to fuel their next stage of growth? Um, as an exchange, that is our job, really. Um, so when we went around the marketplace, we realized that entrepreneurs are spending an enormous amount of time to raise capital. And some of the data that we see in Singapore today uh, is that you know, an, a typical entrepreneur would have to knock on about 300 doors to invite perhaps one or two offers to invest in their companies. And really at that stage of their growth, that time would be better spent focusing on the business and developing it. And so we thought, we can play a role of aggregating investors and good ideas. And Singapore is the perfect place for this in the region. Today, we are one of the largest wealth management centers in the world with some 2.4 trillions of asset under management. So capital is not the issue. As Stephen mentioned, I think sometime earlier, really it's about finding good ideas and matching investors interested in that good ideas with uh, the, the entrepreneurs. So what this platform aims to do is to allow entrepreneurs, uh, we are at the start, I think the idea is to have accredited investors or institutional investors. Because one of the things that we also find when we uh, speak to the different stakeholders is that it's not just about money. At that stage of their life, it's about smart money. It's about what else can you give me apart from capital. Uh, and that's what we seek to do. Uh, so Stephen and I, we've been uh, hard at it for, the, for, for quite some time now, uh, and we hope to get it up and running soon. Yep, uh, I will just add to that to say that we actually have a booth out there, <laughs> so uh, please do come by and uh, talk to us. But I think the reality is, uh, being, uh, having been an entrepreneur, and still, still I am an entrepreneur with startups, uh, uh, companies, um, <coughs> and I've raised no, no less than you know, 12, 15 rounds of fundraising, it's really hard work. Uh, it's an emotional coaster ride. And what we had to learn, like for example, in the case of uh, a clear, uh, court life, um, is that you have to transition from a startup you know, to a corporatized 
intensity, and, and that is something that I think most of us, particularly first-time entrepreneurs, need to learn really quick. For the seasoned entrepreneurs, it's still uh, hit and miss sometimes, because uh, you know, you, you, because of the nature of the industry and the nature of the investors itself. But with uh, a, a coordinated, curated platform, you can almost think of a way where the company can be groomed, can be grown. You know that uh, you you are always ready to to have an electronic data room where information can be shared, whether it's to existing investors or whether it is to prepare for the next round, or eventually these uh, information, if it is well made up, uh, uh, accurate, that they form your basis and backbone for a, a either an exit through an IPO or, or an acquisition. That kind of curation, I think, has been missing. Right. A, a lot of times, as traditional classic uh, investors, it's really about putting money and asking some critical questions here and there and sitting at board meetings. Here we have uh, um, you know, an opportunity, and I'm not just talking about you know, our platform, I'm, I'm talking about this whole entire space uh, of uh, 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 capital raising and crowdfunding. It is really an attempt uh, to help the company uh, grow better. The way of investment hasn't changed, right? The, the criteria for investment hasn't changed that much. But technology has allowed us to be more accurate, more proactive, and as entrepreneurs, you should really learn more about these sort of uh, funding uh, approach. Because that's coming in, and uh, it's set, in my opinion at least, it's set to change the way uh, how we raise funds. Um, it's happening, it started in the US, the wave has not just uh, uh, come to Asia, it has kind of gone over, but this whole space will uh, consolidate and will mature very fast, right? As I've said, the fundamental activity of what we are trying to do is not new, but the way they are doing it is, is new. Mm. Right. Well, that's very helpful. Uh, so maybe um, Chip and potentially Marito, maybe you can, um, based on your experience in US and Europe, uh, what are you seeing, and especially if you think something is relevant for Asia, you know, things like Angel List or Funders Club. What, what are those, uh, some of those platforms, w w where do you see the most promise and what's the most interesting for this region? Well, I think, um, you know, the, the greatest uh, value add out, out of these platforms, Nasser and Stephen really just highlighted, it, is that it's r raising money for entrepreneurs can just take a tremendous amount of time and, and take away from building the business. So to the extent uh, these platforms can, can streamline that process uh, in terms of outreach and then ultimately to getting to closing also, uh, can even once you have everybody committed, uh, can, can be incredibly time consuming. Um, I, I do think kind of the counterpoint to it, and, and we've, you know, in the US there's a number of platforms uh, that are well established as well as uh, relatively recently, about a month ago, uh, new regulations coming into effect that really institutionalize this. Um, the counterpoint really is to be mindful of building a cap structure uh, that doesn't create problems down the road, um, whether that's later stages of uh, uh, venture financing or ultimately on an exit. Um, we're always, uh, from a very early stage, we always advise our clients to try to keep it simple, and, and there is an established market of what uh, deal terms at each stage should look like, and certainly deals will vary. But you want to stay close to that market so that a later investor or, or ultimately a buyer is not, you know, they, they should love your company and want to buy or invest in your company and not see your cap structure as a red flag. And when you're potentially bringing on hundreds of individual stockholders for relatively small amounts, um, all of whom have rights as stockholders, uh, you, you create potential for issues down the line that, not saying that it, it, it's wrong or that it's not a good thing, but it, it's certainly something to be mindful of as these platforms evolve. Any of the platforms, platforms that don't have this uh, disadvantage that you're observing? Because obviously, you know, in some cases, uh, people aggregate their in demand in funds or syndicates so they, in, in some ways, solve this problem of sort of aggregating a uh, larger number of smaller investors. Uh, so, and I would assume that some of the platforms at least do solve this problem. Uh, any of them you would mention? Um, well, I, I think, 
you know, some of them do. I think um, um, uh, Seed and Invest talks about doing that. Um, um, and that that is then minimizing your number of stockholders. Um, you still have, and that some of them also in a different way, kind of attacking a different problem, institutionalize a transaction document. So, so making um, uh, uniform what those rights will be uh, across all investors, I think, is also an important component so you don't end up with individual negotiations. Yeah. Okay. And, and I actually do agree that there's some level of curation needs to happen. Uh, if not, you just have a runway, <laughs> you know, kind of a campaign. Uh, but just, just to give more color in terms of the technology that's coming to bear on this. Uh, so like our platform, we actually track, uh, se we use 17 global databases to track all the transaction that was done in any particular sector. What that means is we have uh, a huge amount of analytics to be able to create comparables for the company in order to, to, to understand, you know, at what stage are they going to be successful based on what valuation and what are the likely uh, acquirers or exit options. So uh, from an early stage when we onboard them, we already know kind of what are the viable possible pathways they can take. And these are tracking actual transaction that has happened in the last 15 years. So for every sector we know, more or less, this company made this announcement, made this acquisition, did this deal. At what point can you know can they become like a template? Mm -hmm. uh, and and that I think that the, uh, until recently that that was not really possible, uh, or rather they were locked up with big institution. But now it's being democratized. It's being made available to the small guys, which is why you see this flourish uh, of, of uh, crowdfunding space. Yeah, I totally agree that the platform. In somehow it's going to be kind of future. It's an all investment company fund should have an open platform to to address the money easier. There is the creation; it is a, a key point. But if we go to see an example, the crowdsource for content, it was five years ago, starting getting crowdsource for design, for idea, for uh, contents in general. And the difference has always been done by the curation. So I see the management team working to the curation. The accelerator is another way to create curation from a deal flow. But they all those money need to make easier access to all these demand from startup initiative, uh, projects, whoever wants, needs money. Because we, need, we have money from the seed, we need money from the post seed, we need the money in the bridge to the series A. And then once we get into A, B, or C fund uh, round, it's gonna be more professional, it's gonna be maybe more um, close for specific fund. But staying st till the seed to the uh, series A, I believe that platforms could be, uh, we're also considering to uh, create uh, inside our investment company an open platform to let our investors to join our selection and our creation work we do it instead of just raising money in the traditional way it is it's even more expensive you know it's a uh, raising money manage the money the management fees are very heavy and uh, I believe I, I I totally I totally support the the platform for the future Great, so we're almost out of time. Uh, one last question I will pose to the panel, and I will ask you to just maybe do one sentence or more. Uh, what advice do you have for the entrepreneurs in the room uh, trying to raise financing? Just one sentence or more. Um, I guess uh, find the right investor for the right stage of growth. Um, you know, uh, not, not every investor type is suitable for every stage and you evolve that, in, that investor group. Great advice. For me, I think an entrepreneur needs to think not only about the immediate fundraising exercise, but also the next one and the subsequent ones that come after that. Great. Yeah, I, I'd echo that. I, I'd say to, to go back to one of my earlier points, but to keep the, the terms that you're agreeing to, be mindful of what the market is and uh, not stray too far, but also not just focus on the current deal, but model out. Uh, your capital needs uh, through the next two rounds so that you're, you know, in terms of dilution, what ultimately you might be uh, looking at. 
Great, Maurice. It's always the smart money makes the difference. So, as you, you mentioned before, it's you need to pick the right investor. When you start, you need to get the right angel because it helps you with advice. When you go into the Series A, you need the right investor for the Series A because it bridge to the Series B and so on. So let's say smart money is the key. Great. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. We'll please everyone give a round of applause to the panel. Thank you.